Hi everybody, welcome back to 10% True. This interview is one of two special interviews I conducted to commemorate the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Storm, sometimes known as the First Gulf War. In this, the first part of the first interview, Adam Robinson, a Royal Air Force tornado navigator, talks about flying the tornado and his squadron's preparations leading up to war. In part two, he'll describe his experiences under fire to include attacking an airfield on the very first night of the war. Both parts were recorded back in September 2000, so that might explain some of the references Adam makes to dates and anniversaries. Adam, thanks so much for sharing your experiences. It's an important oral history, and I'm really grateful that you agreed to sit down and talk. My second interview is with Rick Cluzo-Tolini, who was also airborne that first night of the war. He led the first fighter sweep into Iraq. Two days later, he'd shoot down a MiG-25. To hear his story, and to make sure you get notified that part two of Adam's interview is available, subscribe and hit the bell button. Oh, and feel free to like and share. Enjoy. Um, what made me join? I always wanted to join the Air Force. Never wanted to do anything else. Don't ask me why. I, I, I just don't recall exactly why, but I always loved aircraft. I used to make plastic models one a week. Um, at the, uh, just sort of throw them together because I was just so absorbed by the whole idea of them. And sometimes I'd make a model twice because it was different colours, you know, that sort of thing. I was that obsessed. Uh, and that obsession was only enhanced when I was 10, and it was the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 77. Uh, and it turned out, as we, as I now know we our house was just about 30 miles extended center line from Finningley where the review was uh, I think that was July 77 uh, and I remember walking home from school and one afternoon I was just sort of the top of our road about to get into home get home uh, and three Vulcans lying astern flew over uh, which really impressed me uh, and then the next day it was three Vulcans and six lightnings uh, and then the day after, it was three Vulcan, six Lightnings and six Phantoms. Uh, and it was some, you know, something like that. You know, the, the details are probably not correct, but the, the Vulcans were the centerpiece, clearly. Uh, and they were rehearsing. Uh, and this just absolutely stunned me. Uh, and then we went to the air show the day after um, the, uh, the review. And it was my first air show, I pretty sure uh, and that was excellent you know the Vulcans and my mum absolutely having a, a panic attack when the F-111 did its uh, dump and burn uh, the Australian F-111 uh, and it was just sort of magical to me so yeah that was it a heart set on joining the Air Force so I applied for a sixth form scholarship at 14 uh, and got that and I remember seeing my school reports because I've still got them saying, um, not sure what Adam's going to do if he doesn't get into the Air Force. Well, I was thinking, I am in. Yeah, I've got it. I've just got to get my A-levels and that's a given. That's fine. Well, sort of. Um, so did six full scholarship. So it was £1,500, I think, over two years for my mum and dad, which was nice, you know, whilst I was in sick form. Went to Granton on Spey for two weeks, horribly homesick. Um, I was 16 at the time. Uh, what else? So flying scholarship, horribly homesick uh, for a month. Uh, did the flying, that was okay. Um, and then that would have been 16 going on 17. Then a year later, did my A-levels, did okay A-levels. I only had to pass them, didn't have to be any particular grade. So that was it, I was in. So I was waiting to go in the January intake and then got a phone call in well, probably about 35 years ago today, almost, that um, we've got a space coming up in two weeks. Do you want to um, do you want to be on it? Or, oh, mm, OK. Yeah, I suppose I ought to say yes. Uh, so joined the Air Force on September the 29th, 1985, uh, and started at officer training at Cranwell. So oh, in the interim, obviously, I joined the Air Cadets and had a thoroughly good time with the air cadets uh, and it was obviously a good grounding because out of my friend group in the air, uh, air cadets we've got one group captain two air commodores uh yeah and then me <laughs> um and there was yeah there's another one no another one who i think left as a flight lieutenant uh and 
Yeah, there, so there were, there were a decent group of us who were like-minded, uh, joined the Air Force, generally air crew. Uh, we did okay. Yeah, I went to uh, RF North Luffenham for aeromedical training uh, for a week. Uh, and then I started my flying course. Now, because I'd done a flying scholarship, I didn't do the flying selection squadron, which was, I think, 30 hours uh, on chipmunks at Swinderby. Uh, and I also, because there were spaces, I went to Cranwell. I also didn't do the JP, the Jet Province Mark III, which you would have done if you, I would have done if I'd gone to Linton, on Ouse or Church Fenton. So I went from doing my flying scholarship uh, a pre the previous year to Jet Provost Mark V. Uh, not a huge amount of difference, I suppose, between the three and five apart from performance, not enough to make a difference. But I think not doing the flying selection probably made the difference because I was so behind the drag curve. And I just, because I was out of school only six months previously, I hadn't quite learned how to learn. You know, I hadn't, uh, everything had been sort of placed in front of me and that, as a school kid. And that wasn't quite the way it was in the Air Force. So I struggled. I did struggle. Uh, I invented um, the no capacity rejoin, uh, getting into the circuit, get out of the way. Adam's coming. He hasn't got a clue what he's doing. And it's always nice, always nice to be met as you shut down by your flying instructor and the flight commander, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Adam, can, I think we need a word about the radar pattern. <laughs> so after struggling through pilot training um, from March 86 to 31st October 1986, Halloween, I got chopped on Halloween. Uh, and, you know, as, as they always say, after the, the third go at the test and I got chopped at spin arrows so probably the first opportunity to properly get chopped um, after the third go of that it was a bit of a relief to know that I had finally run out of road on that uh, and then I went and got horribly drunk at the Halloween party it's it, it is interesting <laughs> that I mean that pe people do say exactly that don't they that, that actually there's a sense of relief that comes with it because you're under yeah, a, a, a considerable amount of pressure externally and internally i suppose mm. um and, and what's you also know, you know you don't have to do it again you know that's it you know the, the, there's no question you know there's no oh i don't know should we give him another chance no that was it mm. done i was listening to a a podcast recently by a guy called Tim Davies. He's an ex fast jet instructor, mm -hmm. uh, tornado guy, yeah. and and um, and he was saying now the training pipeline for fast jet um, pilots because that's you know where he comes from. Yeah, uh, it's something like seven years now. So yeah. for seven years you have the axe sort of hanging over your head. At any point you're only ever three rides away from being chopped, and um, you know <laughs> so if you get through that, that's quite an achievement. But I it's a huge thing, pressure for a long time. Yeah. And, and I, I think probably one of the things that, that if you've never flown before, it's sort of difficult to get your head around is that, that actually sort of the hands and feet bit and the hand-eye coordination bit can be quite easy. But knowing where you are relative to everybody else and having that situational awareness, that, that takes some doing, doesn't it? It takes some mental capacity to develop that. Completely correct, yeah, because some of my better flying was instrument flying when I was under the hood uh, and the instructor at that stage was doing the situational awareness for me and so all I had to do was fly the numbers uh, so I didn't have to look out I didn't have to get the right attitude visually I could just do it on the on the instruments uh, I didn't have to at that stage worry about where I was particularly the instructor was doing that for me so yeah you know that showed my lack of capacity that I could do one thing or the other but not both so, so let's go back then to the, the morning after that, that Halloween night where you got horrendously drunk. How, yeah. how do you feel? What are your options? What do you want to do? Very hungover. Uh, and, 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 and rather, oh, God, what did I do? Who do I have to apologise to? <laughs> <laughs> I, it, was, it was interesting in those days because if you did okay, if you were a good egg, you just got a recommendation for navigator training. And I just wanted to fly. So, you know, pilot training would have been great. Navigator training, next best option. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have to go back for reselection, which came in probably not that long after that. So we're talking back end of 86 now. 
Uh, and uh, I got a recommendation from the AOC, the Air Officer Commanding, for navigator training. So that was a given. I was going to go to nav training, uh, which is great. <clears throat> so I went down to Lynham to Hulk after um, being chopped. Uh, so I must have been there from November through to February. Um, and that was fun. I managed to have a week in the Caribbean on a Caribbean trainer. So, you know, in December, can't knock that. Uh, and it was a good experience for going into the, the sort of seeing what outside of training looks like. So I started navigator training at Binningley uh, in February 87 uh, and went through, I went straight through, all the way through um, without any, uh, without too many issues until June 88. <coughs> Excuse me, sir. <coughs> the um, nav training at that in those days was started off doing a lot of ground school, doing a lot of log on chart and doing manual wind finds and things, proper traditional navigation, sort of stuff that you would have done in a Halifax or a Lancaster. Uh, and there's and there's a reward, a rewarding feeling to getting that right. And, and interesting, I found early on that navigator was probably more suited. I was more suited to being a navigator, more my mindset, you know, sort of un getting the satisfaction of just getting things right. Uh, in that respect. So uh, quite a bit of ground school, then some simulator, most archaic basic simulator that you can think of, but it worked. Uh, and then high level Domini flying, which was 10, 12 trips, something like that. And that was all high level, traditional, old fashioned, using the kit, uh, looking uh, backwards, sitting down the back of a Domini, uh, as you would have done in a Vulcan or a Victor or a Valiant, uh, and doing manual wind finds and then automatic wind finds, and that, that was okay. It was a, it was um, uh, an, it was an art. It was a complete art, uh, and I didn't do too badly on that. Then it was low level Jet Provost. Uh, on the back on the Jet Provost T5, so I'd got a slight advantage in that that uh, in that the that aircraft wasn't unfamiliar to me, so I probably I probably helped ease my way into that. Uh, and again, uh, what was ten trips or something like that, low level navigation, enjoyed that. Yeah, did okay on that. Then got so at the end of that, which is probably just over halfway through, then uh, got streamed to fast jets. Which is great. What I obviously what I wanted, uh, uh, low level dominies, uh, and that was oh my god, what on earth is this? Uh, using the radar, using predictions of radar, Mickey Mouse ears or whatever on an Echo 190 that was used last used over Berlin in 1945, um, and uh, all all sitting backwards at 500 feet in a dominie. I didn't have the first clue of what was happening. I stumbled through and I, I failed a couple of trips. Uh, I don't think I was actually put on review, but I, I did fail a couple of trips. Uh, and then at the, um, the final nav test, which was on your own down the back without any form of assistance, certainly without an instructor there, you were left to your own devices and you flew the route and the two guys up front knew how well you were doing. Uh, uh, and it ran on rails. It just happened. Uh, and the end of course report, I was um, uh, accused of being lazy and only pulling my finger out at the last moment to make it count. I have no idea how it happened. No idea whatsoever. They completely misjudged me on that. But I was lucky enough to go through. Um, at the end of that course, uh, that particular phase of the course, I was recommended for an aircraft without a radar. So that'll be Canberra's then. <laughs> But then I went to the low level Jet Provost, which was a little bit of ground attack, a little bit of air defense, low level, some high level stuff, low level intercepting, Rat and Terrier, they used to call it. And I did really well on that. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I got some good scores. So at the end of all of that, uh, I got posted. Uh, and you have to remember this is June 88. So this is the height of the build-up of the tornado force. So by and large, you're going to go to tornadoes. Uh, and I got tornado GR1s. Uh, and, you know, you, you ring your parents up and rang my mum and said, I've got tornadoes. Oh, that's nice, dear. What's that? <laughs> yeah, lovely. Thanks, mum. Uh, 
I didn't get Air Force, which is what I wanted. Uh, I wanted to fly pilot Air Force, but navigating Air Force would have been next best option. I didn't get that because uh, I didn't do particularly well on the air defence side of things. That was a bit more sort of juggling figures in your head rather than having pre-planned line on a map. Uh, so it just sort of it wasn't wasn't for me as as it turned out, which is probably the right decision. I was going to get posted to Buccaneers, but uh, Buccaneer had Martel TV equipment in the back seat, uh, and your leg length, your your thigh length was important. You know, you were you were measured to see if you would fit in the back seat of the cockpit uh, of the uh, the Buccaneer cockpit, uh, and my thigh length was just too long, so uh, that that ruled out Buccaneers. And actually, I subsequently went to Lossy uh, when the Buccaneers were there, and it was it was odd because the pilots were big beefy guys there's no big no real reason why they were big beefy guys but the navigators it was like a meeting of the jockey club you know they're all yeah little umpa lumpers uh and uh and i still know you know some buccaneer nabs who went on to tornadoes and they're not the tallest guys <laughs> for very good reason and i'm absolutely joe average five foot nine so you know they were shorter than me so yeah um Stream two tornadoes, uh, June 88 at the end of NAV training. You mentioned then um, the tornado force was building up around that time. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a brief overview as to what, you know, the, the different, the, the two different main different variants of the tornado at that time, F3 and. Well, um, well let's, let's rule out the F3s because that's, let's just rule out the F3s full stop. I, I, and I will be rude to people. I don't care. F3s. Um, air defense. Um, show ponies. Um, the F threes were taken over from the F fours, um, and they were building up. So they had two squadrons plus a training unit at Coningsby. Um, they were yet to get the Leeming force. They came, I think, about eighty nine because we hosted them in Germany uh, later, uh, and they had two squadrons, forty three treble one at uh, Lucas taking over from the fact that, in fact, no, no, they hadn't taken, they were taking over because when I went to Tornadoes, there was still the F4 training unit up there, uh, which had moved up from Coningsby. So it was still very much building up, um, but they were purely UK based. You then had the GR1s, which started off, started their life with, I think it was nine squadron at Honington. Uh, and you then had two squadrons, six or seven and 27 at Marham. They were the um, uh, the 95 UK based um, training units. I, I, I use I say rudely and lightly uh, because the the real frontline units were in Royal Air Force Germany in West Germany, um, uh, and that's where I ended up. But yeah, we'll we'll come on to that in a, in a bit. You had four squadrons ultimately at Larbrook, although I think 88 they hadn't quite formed the fourth because I think. Um, the recce units were still forming uh, and they'd probably just lost, lost the Buccaneers. Uh, and then you had four units at Bruggen, 9, 14, 17 and 31 squadron. And I'd been to Bruggen uh, as part of an air cadet summer camp. So clearly I knew Bruggen int uh, intimately for the week that I was there. Uh, so, yeah, you've got the, the F3s, which are probably about effectively give or take half the size uh, in fleet as the, uh, the GR1s. You then, of course, have got the Jaguars at Coltishaw with the training unit at um, Lossy at the time. Uh, and you've got the Buccaneers who had just all moved up to um, Lossy. So you've got the training unit, 12 Squadron and 208 Buccaneers at Lossy Mouth. Uh, and I think that's probably it. And then so, the helicopters. So for anybody then who doesn't know about the Tornado, the variant you're talking about is the GR1, which yeah. is the... Uh, what is the what is the nomenclature? Is that ground recce? GR? Does that stand ground, for ground, ground, attack and re, ground attack and reconnaissance? Okay. Um, which is why the typhoon is FGR now, fighter ground attack reconnaissance. Um, pre, um, protector's going to be RG reconnaissance and ground attack because that shows the um, uh, the precedent in roles. You know the uh, um, which one's the most important. So you were uh, uh, you were going to be flying then a ground attack aircraft. Can, yeah. can you can you describe them? What was because the tornado was new and um, relatively what, yeah. 
what was it bringing then to the RAF that it didn't, didn't have before? Well, it was taking over from the Buccaneers, and it was taking over or uh, taking over by, by and large from the Buccaneers, by and large from the uh, uh, the Jaguars. Uh, it brought uh, it was trinational aircraft, so Germany, Italy, UK. Um, uh, and all the political considerations, both positive and negative, with that. Uh, it was probably, almost certainly, as a result of TSR2 being cancelled in the in 65, uh, because we didn't have a proper successor. That's why the RAF got Buccaneers, which is intended a, and was a Navy aircraft. Uh, it's why the F-4s came, but they were uh, then moved over to the air defence role. Uh, and so the, the Tornado came in and it, it gave... 1980s technology so it had a, a good radar a good ground mapping radar it also had a separate terrain following radar so it could fly automatic terrain following hands off down to 200 feet uh, in at night any weather uh, and we did that we practiced that and it was very a, a very impressive system it could carry up to 8,000 pounds of bombs or all the it struggled at 8,000. Um, it didn't have the range of the Buccaneer. The Buccaneer could go forever. Uh, it was faster than the Buccaneer in theory, but if you wanted to go fast, you'd forget the range because you were pouring petrol out the back like nobody's business. So, you know, range and performance, no better than the Buccaneer, but it was more modern, much more modern avionics. Uh, like I say, it had uh, a good ground mapping radar and a, comp and a good uh nav attack computer two tv screens either side of the uh, the map display which showed you where you were on your route uh, and showed you time to go uh, and so it took a lot of the uh, the navigator's workload off him to do the weapon aiming obviously subsequently later you got gps which even took the the navigation out of it but at that time very much you used the radar to update the nav uh, nav equipment so primarily my role on Tornado Geo-1s in the back was um, updating the nav kit using the electronic warfare suite, so the radar warning receiver, jamming pod, chaff and flares, uh, and being a, a second set of eyes. So I, I was thinking when, when you were talking about um, the training and being in the back of the Domini um, and, and sort of doing things the old-fashioned way, I was, I was thinking, I wonder how much of that you ended up doing operationally. Was there ever, ever a time when you had to go back to those sort of old methods? Not, not wholly, not not completely. And, and I think probably what the Domini taught me was not a great deal because I didn't really learn a great deal about the radar. I should have learned more, um, but it just, it foxed me. Uh, and so my radar learning was done much more on the Tornado. It was a far, far better radar. I could imagine, I could see things on that radar that I just couldn't, get my, my head around on the uh, the Echo 190 and the Domini. Um, so the Domini work, I don't think, for me, there was a great deal that I fell back on. The Jet Provis stuff, more so. So map and stopwatch, sometimes when the kit in the Tornado was running uh, away because it, it would drift. Uh, and if you did it, put a, a, an incorrect fix in at just the wrong time, it would just run away to oblivion. Uh, and you'd be the the map would show you over the water, and you're flying over fields. And well, clearly the map's correct, isn't it? So well, it must be over the water. Um, so sometimes it's just best to turn it turn it off, uh, and just rely upon map and stopwatch. You uh, and sometimes you had to train that. To, you know, to, you had to do reversionary training just to keep the practice in. You you'd get to the range, and then the pilot would do the uh, uh, the bomb aiming because you probably weren't in a good state of mind to, to do that. Uh, but other people who were more, much more gifted than me, uh, and I was very Joe Average, um, other people probably did cope with doing a radar bomb properly, uh, having done map and stopwatch. I don't think I managed that because it was my first tour. I was quite junior and quite average. So what were you... What were you doing then in, in terms of um, who were you preparing to fight? Uh, what was the fight going to look like? Where was it going to take place? The fight was, uh, we were flying over the IGB, the inner German border, um, across the ADIS, the Air Defence Identification Zone, uh, to attack the 3rd Shock Army of the Soviet Army. 
uh, all great stuff, you know, good, proper Cold War stuff. I arrived in on 31 Squadron in Germany in June 89. So although things were starting to ease up, you know, um, Hungary was allowing um, move, freedom of movement, things like that. Czechoslovakia was starting to do similar. Uh, although there was those sort of buds of things uh, coming you know, communism falling, uh, and of course, perestroika was happening with Gorbachev. The Cold War was still very much the Cold War, even six months before um, the uh, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, and so we were practicing as if it was real, uh, and our targets were primarily airfields um, west of Berlin because the tornado didn't really have the the legs to do uh, any more than that, uh, and it was to drop JP233, which we'll come on to when we talk about the first Gulf War, uh, runway denial weapon, uh, to take out the um, uh, the airfields of uh, East Germany that the Soviets and the DDR were using. Uh, also dropping uh, thousand pound bombs. The tornado had a role for a laser guided bomb, but that wasn't something that we did. I think that was. Uh, the Larbrook squadrons uh, and maybe the Marum squadrons did it, but Bruggen didn't do it at that time. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we also did nukes, uh, WE-177 tactical nuclear weapon, uh, which was the most important role on the station, uh, flying a an SSP singleton schedule profile, I think it stood for, which was flying a single aircraft around in practice around north germany uh, to drop a bomb on nordhorn range or something like that a, a three kilogram practice bomb but that was to simulate flying with a tactical nuclear weapon which would have if you dropped it on an airfield would have destroyed most of the airfield um probably not all of it but most of it uh, they they weren't um big weapons in the big scheme of things but politically they were massive uh, uh, and the, the most serious crew that you could have on an exercise shadowing what you would do for real was the cell use crew, which was a selective use. And you were Sakya's people designated to show that the West was prepared to use w nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you uh, that was serious stuff. Did you expect to come back from, from those sorties? Um, I, I remember talking to an F-111 guy once and he said to me, that what so you know this is fairly recently actually and, and he told me his target would have been sevastopol i think it was mm -hmm. called the the sub pens there and he said to me their calculations were once they dropped the weapon they would have had 60 seconds of fuel and that would have been it so they they were not going to come home we we had the fuel um had the fuel to get back to west germany uh, and on each exercise you had the the designated first west which was the first airfield west of the uh, forward line of troops um, that you could get to in uh, uh, in the exercise. So you wouldn't actually fly this, but it was um, if you'd flown to Jutabog or to Rostock or somewhere like that, and you then headed west, you probably had the fuel to get to somewhere like Sella uh, or Soest or somewhere like that. So you could at least land and then get a refuel and then get back to Bergen. But you probably wouldn't have gone to Bruggen there or Bruggen there and back in in one hop. Did you did you talk amongst yourselves and 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 sort of consider whether you'd actually have anything to come back to? Um, because this is you're talking about tactical nuclear weapons, right? So so for anybody who's not familiar, and I'm I'm not an expert, so tell me if I'm wrong. But you know, strategic <laughs> nuclear weapons are these big things that can destroy cities. You're talking about a very specific use to destroy a military target, um, and I guess in the sort of the spectrum of nuclear weaponry. Um, you're sort of at the the more sort of uh, the less offensive end. You know, mm. It's not it's not the end of the world or sort of you know the less destructive certainly. Yeah. But you you've still got everything else. You know you've got the fallout and uh, and everything that. So uh, you know you you expected there to be very uh, a very different existence. You know you you always had every six weeks or so you had your week long exercise and the script was always similar uh, and you, you'd have the station tannoy saying right it's day uh, day one is transition to war the soviets are 
starting to look uh, a little bit uh, anxious and a little bit uh, aggressive. Oh, it's day two. Um, the Soviets have declared war. It was always them declared war over us. We, yeah, we were the good guys. Um, and then you got uh, day three. All the dependents have been shipped out of Prugen, uh, and they were they they've crossed the channel. They're, they're they're on the way back to England. There was a ferry sunk by submarines, but and it was always that. Oh, thanks. That's really what you want to hear. Um, and then you you knew that it was um, Armageddon or Index coming up. Was um, was when you the, the rations you got babies' heads. Uh, which was steak and, ki- steak and kidney pudding. You always knew, last meal, steak and kidney pudding, uh, which was great because, you know, well, it's Thursday night. Yeah, it'll be called Endex. Let's go to the bar. Uh, and then Friday morning, you'd have the, the wing launch uh, after having been to the bar, which was never great. 40 aircraft, all um, trying to get airborne uh, without air traffic comms. Uh, just on green lights and uh, working on takeoff times, jockeying for position, always immense fun. There was, uh... Uh, but but I sorry, but I I didn't actually answer your question. Um, you have to remember, I was probably what twenty two at the stage. Uh, I was single. Uh, I I was bulletproof. I didn't give. I, I didn't think about that sort of thing. Uh, the married guys clearly did, and it did get talked about in the crew room. But I have to say, it probably washed over me. I was pretty shallow. Still am. <laughs> and honest, too. <laughs> there, there is a, a, a sort of a picture that's painted if you read books about guys who flew um, in West Germany during the, the Cold War mm. uh, of, of sort of, um, you know, unrestrained flying possibilities you know you know obviously you don't cross the border but you can fly really really low you can bounce anybody go and you know sort of engage in mock combat is, is that true is that was that how it was when you were there not when i was there no no flying in germany was it wasn't great it was nice to go south because that's the pretty part um when we divvied up west germany the americans got the pretty part and we got the flat part um so flying the north german plane you always got a smog, you know, a fog. Uh, and so the visibility was invariably just on the limits, 5Ks, uh, and it was flat. And there were only a few decent turning points like the Piheim mast, which is where all the Vilnrath F4s always waited because their nav kit was always rubbish. So you could always guarantee a bit of a fight. The great thing was there were lots of aircraft, so you always get a bit of a bit of a fight uh, involved, which always livened things up. But the navigation was boring. It was 500 feet. Uh, apart from in designated areas, there were some low flying areas, I think probably up to eight, one of which was all of about 30 seconds worth of flying. Uh, and you could go down to 250 feet then. Uh, but then you'd have to pull up again to 500 feet. And then halfway through my tour, after reunification, after the Gulf War, they got rid of low flying completely. So the low flying, the rewarding low flying was always in the UK, always far, far better. So um, certainly the second half of my tour, when they'd got rid of low flying, we used to fly to the UK all the time. You'd burn, it'd take you an hour, um, 50, 59 minutes with 4,900 kilograms of gas. That's how long and how much fuel you had left when entering the UK low level at Amble Light in Northumberland from Bruggen. Not that I did it much, that it's still emblazoned in my mind. <laughs> but no, um, no, flying in Germany, apart from lots of jets being around, wasn't great. wasn't the greatest. What, what, did, what, did, what does good low level flying look like then? Uh, 100 feet, um, 450, 480 knots. Um, with with an aircraft trying to shoot you down, um, that's just immense fun. Um, and I had lots of fun later in uh, in the Chinook at 50 feet um, doing some fighter invasion. Uh, you know, it, it's it's exciting stuff. It's um, I mean, even in Germany, if you've got a uh, pairs bound, so you're flying two aircraft uh, and another mate from the squadron is trying to attack you. Uh, and you don't quite know where he's going to be. And, you know, he does a little bit of uh, attacking. You do a little bit of reacting and then he disappears off. And you, you know he's gone, but he's not gone because he's going to find another way of cutting short the route and uh, attacking you from somewhere else. Yeah, that's fun. That's lots of fun. Uh, so, but, you know, low level, down at 100 feet and in good scenery. You know, so a bit of hilliness um, going around the hills, 
flat. It's like going on a motor, like low level in, on, in flatlands. It's like driving a car at 100 miles an hour on the motorway. You know, you can do it, but. So what uh, I, I've got lots of questions around this. Uh, uh, and, uh, <laughs> it, um, so, so, so the first question then is, um, and this, become, this this will become pertinent or more relevant mm. perhaps later in our conversation when we talk about uh, you know what you guys did out there in, in Iraq in, in 91. But um, what was the purpose of, of low-level flying? Why did you do it? Uh, radar avoidance. Uh, because air defense radars, you know, they, they first started to appear in Vietnam with the, the SA-2 uh, and then the SA-3 and then Yom Kippur brought the, in 73 brought the SA-6 uh, but they've all got a minimum engagement height uh, and so you either fly above them not possible as Gary Powers found in uh, 1960 uh, or you fly below them. Yeah we had um, jamming pods which were relatively effective they were pretty good they'd they they'd reduce the uh, uh, possibility of kill uh, and increase your survivability quite nicely, uh, but it wasn't guaranteed. Uh, the only thing that you could guarantee is um, putting ground between you and the, the radar head. So you flew as low as you could to avoid radars. And that's what we did in the Gulf War to start with, uh, to get under the radars, not necessarily to not be engaged by them because ultimately you'll be seen, but to minimize the exposure that you had to them uh, and give yourself the, a better fighting chance so that you're seen later by them and their engagement cycle needs to be spun up to engage you. Yeah, because uh, th these systems also have a, an amount of time, don't they? They've got to find <laughs> you, you know, fix you, track you, uh, you know, do whatever it is that they do computationally to get a missile in the air and, and, and sort of going towards you. So that's the other thing too, right? So yeah, ab um, absolutely. So, so the um, yeah, the culmination of that training was um, uh, red flag in Nevada, uh, uh, and I was fortunate enough to do exercise red flag in March, April, nineteen ninety, which was quite fortuitous as it turned out. Later, uh, I'd just been made combat ready in order to do red flag. We did a workup at Lucas in uh, and round Scotland before that, but then had three weeks of flying on red flag, and that was just immense fun because that's everything I've just described. It was the low level, 100 feet. There were very, very few rules uh, as to uh, where you could and couldn't low fly. Uh, and you've got a lot of aircraft in the sky, a lot of people wanting to try and figuratively shoot you down, uh, both in the air and on the ground. Uh, and it was just immense fun to try and counter all of those uh, and get through to the target and drop live bombs you know, drop real thousand pound bombs that really properly went bang when they landed. Uh, and yeah, it immense, immense fun. And the social obviously can't be underestimated in Vegas. What did you get a chance when, when you were at Red Flag? Um, so talking about this sort of, um, this sort of, I don't know what you call it, evasion or, or these sort of tactics to avoid the the, the threat mm. for as long as possible. Did, did they did they op open up their um, the fact they had SA sixes and, and sort of Soviet systems to you? Were you able to experience yeah. them for real? Yeah, but the don't forget the UK also had that. We've got Spade Adam um, Electronic Warfare Training Range where they have real systems and had real systems those days. There was no big secret about that, although it was probably restricted at the time. Um, Red Flag had a bit more. Um, I don't think they had, they had a bit more in numbers more than anything, but not um, in capability. Uh, there's a you know, there's a simulator, there's the emulator, and then there's the real thing. So uh, there's a lot of simulators and emulators which give enough of a spike on your radar warning receiver to make you think it's an SA6 or whatever, uh, but it's not actually. Uh, uh, but it, enough to give the training value. So so it was it yeah. The, there were some things that they were cagey about, which Americans are always cagey about, but things where you think, well, actually, you don't need to be cagey because we know that. Yeah. Did you, did you have... Um, so, so one of the things that I'm sort of curious about is if you listen to the F-117 guys talk about that mm -hmm. first night, there was an element of 
their thinking, which was, will this work? You know, will mm. we will we just get sort of shot down and, and blown to bits, or will we actually get through and, and the technology will be proven? Even though they would have had many opportunities to test the the technology in in the states. Uh, and so I'm, I'm wondering then about the, you know, your jamming pod, your ability to decoy missiles and that kind of stuff. Had you had an opportunity to turn those systems on? And actually see them operate for real and know that they could defeat or they could um, delay the, the enemy in their actions yeah I, I mean i mentioned spade adam and you could do some jamming there um but it was a little bit restricted and you weren't you didn't get the immediate debrief uh, because we flew back to germany and they were still in northumberland or cumbria um what you did get was the debriefing at red flag so you got to see the results of your jamming uh, and it was it would jam single digits. It wouldn't go beyond SA. Um, uh, it, it wouldn't go into the the tens and plus. Um, but it was okay for the the single digit SAMs. Uh, and you would see the results of your jamming. You know, you, you'd have the cam the the ball sighted camera, which was aligned with the the radar, and you'd see it tracking, and then the jamming come on, and it would go wherever. Uh, uh, and similarly, you'd see um, uh, the same with chaff and things like that. So that was the the big positive that you could. It gave you the confidence that your kit was working as it should have done. What's the the contract then between you and the pilot in that low level environment? I mean, you 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 talk fondly about it, 100, 100 or so feet, four hundred and fifty, four hundred and eighty knots, but you're not driving. Um, that sounds pretty thanks. scary to me. Yeah, thanks. No, because he is driving, and that is all he's doing. Uh, you know, he hasn't got the capacity to, particularly, uh, to do anything other than make sure we don't hit the ground, keep as low as he's able to, as long as he's as low as he's confident of keeping, but not hit the ground the rest of it is up to me to make sure that the the fuel's okay that we're not going to run out going in the wrong direction running out of fuel make sure that the uh the kit is updated if i can uh that's harder at low level obviously because the opportunities um certainly on the radar uh come and go a lot more quickly uh, uh, but also keep my eyes open to make sure that we're not going to get bounced uh, you're not flying on your uh, you you on your own you're in a full ship probably so all the other three aircraft are also looking at, they're not looking out just for themselves, they're looking out for you as well. You know, they're, they're checking your six and you're checking their six. Uh, so it's, it's very much a teamwork effort, but the pilots are just concentrating on not hitting the ground and keeping some form of formation integrity. And are they talking to you? I mean, one thing I've noticed from sort of watching videos and um, is that, you know, if the radar altimeter goes off, the pilot, acknowledges it so you know i guess that he knows that he's mm -hmm. just triggered it are there a series of sort of bits of calm or actions that you in the back seat are expecting to see to make sure you know he's in control of the situation yeah i suppose you know you set the rad out at um, your minimum height minus 10 percent i think it was it was 20 percent on the chinook um so, you know, if you're fly, if you're authorized to fly at 250 feet, you will set the rad out at 225 feet. Uh, and now I can't remember how this worked on the tornado. Uh, I think you might have got the light before you got the audio. Uh, but if you got the audio, it meant that you'd gone beneath 225 feet. So that instantly got you looking ahead to make sure that everything was OK. It didn't. Usually it was fine because it was probably just a bit of a, uh, a clip of a ridge or a particularly tall tree that you've gone over uh, and it's just bounced off that and just dipped it below. So nine times out of 10, absolutely fine. But you couldn't afford to be complacent. You couldn't afford to just automatically cancel, which would have been an easy thing to do. Uh, and it would have been a, a cognitive thing to do, but a very wrong um, thing to do. So, yeah, you, you had to be very careful. You had to make sure, uh, and the pilot would always give a reason for that to be, uh, for that going off, you know, trees or climbing or, or whatever it might be. Uh, and you'd acknowledge that. This might sound like a silly question, but um, was it particularly dangerous? Yeah. I mean, low flying uh, 100 feet at 420 plus knots 
it can only be dangerous. You know, there were buccaneers in 1980 that had wing failures and crashed. You know, there's there's no way uh, of uh, things going to go wrong very quickly at that height and that speed. Uh, so to eject is very much more touch and go. Uh, later, you know, in the um, workup for the Gulf War, we lost uh, a Jaguar uh, at low level, uh, which was one of the, the pilot was one of my uh, guys on my pilot training course. Uh, and then we also lost a tornado at low level because they were so low, they just um, clipped a wing into the ground. Uh, and that was our detachment. So, you know, we knew them. They were Bruggen mates. So we knew them very well. So, yeah, it, it is dangerous. Uh, and you, you, you accept that, which is why you don't do it all the time. And you have to have a workup. So, you know, we had our workup at Lucas in Scotland, making sure that you, you can fly low level confidently. So you start at 250 feet and you work your way down so that you can then go to Red Flag in Nevada and do it as you had done in Scotland. It's not just a thing where you can just go and do it. Uh, and don't forget, we also have um, low flying uh, in Goose Bay, which we all do annually. Uh, you, in the in the summer, Goose Bay in uh, in Labrador in Canada, so it's it's something that you practice, though not all the time, and you have to be very carefully authorized and uh, worked up to get down to that height. From, from a um, a nav navigator sort of weapon systems officer point of view, then if you if you're in the low level environment, uh, how much time do you get then to um you know find the target fix it uh, is it done all visually by the pilot if you know or do you pop up um to give yourself time and altitude how does it work no you, you plan it on the uh, on the route round so you're looking for um significant features features that will be radar significant because that was your primary um source of um uh, fixing the kit you, uh, you, it shows up on the radar, you enter it, it goes automatically into the kit, uh, and then you see the, what the error is, how far it is, the kit has drifted, and you accept it or reject it according to the, the confidence of your fix. But you're looking for uh, the, the, mo the ideal um, radar fix is big, unique, and vertical extent. So a TV mast, absolutely brilliant. So you navigate the UK around the TV mast. So anybody who lives near the Belmont mast or the Billsdale mast, well, you know, it's Oz. Because <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you angle the radar up. So you get rid of all the ground clutter. Uh -huh. So you're not looking at the ground. You're then looking at the top of the mast. Yeah. Uh, and it shows as something unique. You go right you, and you reduce the beam width down because the, the mast will look like that. Big, so it's lozenge. So you reduce it all the way down and you know, two miles short pulse. So I was always taught that you, know, you get the scale down on the radar uh, and you stabilize it. And sometimes you get a B scan uh, and then, you, like I say, you go to short pulse and you get it right all the way down and you work the fix until you can't work it anymore. Uh, and then you accept the fix if you think it's a good fix. So a mast is perfect. If you can't have a mast, then corners of woods. Um, particularly unique woods. There's some great ones around North Yorkshire um, where there's nothing else apart from a plantation that's a particular shape uh, or a bridge over a reservoir or a reservoir dam corner, something like that. You've got a contrast. It's contrast between something hard that returns and something like water that doesn't return. The obvious question then, skipping way ahead, uh, which I shouldn't do, but um, mm -hmm. is how did that work in the desert? Presumably, counterintuitively, it's easier because there's nothing else there. And when you see something, it shows up. Yeah, um, there were some good masts just on the Saudi Iraq border because you've got the main supply route that parallels the border. I don't know what, five, 10 miles inside Saudi. Uh, and of course, along the main supply route, the road, you've got telecoms masts. So they were good for kit grabbing, for bringing the kit back into uh, the right area. Uh, and then our target on the first night, um, which is the only low level uh, attack that I did. Um, it was an airfield in the middle of nowhere with a great um, perimeter fence. Uh, it, the perimeter, it was rectangular, you know, so there was the most fantastic radar reflective corner. So you had to have done 
quite well not to have got that right. <laughs> okay. We'll come back to that shortly. Then. Mm-hmm. So, so, so when when did you get your first indication then uh, that something was going on out in the uh, Arabian Gulf? Uh, well, this comes back to Goose Bay. Uh, Goose Bay in Canada, doing our annual two, three-week exercise. Uh, I was, I think we were on the in the minibus. I think it was about lunchtime. Uh, I think we'd just gone back. No, it must have been later because uh, we had lunch on the squadron always. Um, miracle whip. Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I never enjoyed Goose Bay. Most, a lot of people loved it. I never enjoyed Goose Bay. Um, we were in the minibus uh, and we were going back. We got the radio on, uh, listening to the news, and they said that Iraq uh, had invaded Kuwait. Uh, and of course, this was second of August, nineteen ninety. And we thought, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. Back to the bar. Um, you know, it, fine. You know, what, what's this got to do with us? Almost. Yeah, we, yeah we, we knew it was serious, but we didn't know what it would entail. Uh, but then we quickly heard a couple of days later that Bruggen was spinning up to deploy people. Um, and, of course, the F3s had gone early because they'd been in Cyprus on armament practice camp. So they were close to Saudi. So they'd gone within a, a day or so. So it didn't take long from hearing that on the radio to realising things are going to change. Did you um, have to wait till you got back to Germany then to find out what that change was going to be? Uh, yeah, I seem to remember, although I might be wrong, that the crews hadn't deployed by the time we got back. Uh, and I wasn't on the first wave. Uh, so the first deployment was the A-team, the, the experienced guys. They flew out two or three weeks after so back end of August after the jets had been painted all nice and sandy uh, and they flew out to Bahrain where they were where the first detachment was we uh, were the B team uh, and so we stayed back at Bruggen but everybody knew that there, there had to be contingency planning so we spent the rest of the time from August onwards uh, training uh, for uh, deployment. So that was much more low level flying. You know, we, we'd been lucky because we'd done the red flag in the March uh, and we'd done Goose Bay in the August. So we were probably the most experienced squadron at low, uh, ultra low flying, uh, uh, operational low flying at Bruggen. Uh, but we still continued to do OLF, uh, operational low flying, by deploying to Lucas or Lossy uh, to do that. Um, on a fairly regular basis. But then there was lots of toings and throwings and picking up aircraft. The aircraft were being modified with uh, new radios, have quick radios, and yeah, there was quite a bit of toing and throwing of, oh, I need a crew to go to Marham to pick up a jet. I need a crew to go to Wharton to pick up a jet, uh, to St. Athen, things like that. So time was filled with low flying training, but also just doing admin stuff like that. It, it, it was different. It was interesting. I, I'm not sure if you already said it, um, but I, but you were on 31 Squadron, so so that's yes. who you were with. But uh, am I am I right in thinking that there was an aircraft lost in that workup as well over the North Sea? Was it something they lost? That was 27 Squadron. That was okay. Nigel Elston, I think it was, um, who was the OC 27. Um, I remember seeing a plaque, I can't remember where it is now, where it just simply said, lost over the North Sea, um, November or whenever it was, 1990. Um, you know, it was very sort of old fashioned in the way they, they, they said it. Uh, yeah, that was 27 Squadron. So there was, there were losses. You know, there, there was him, uh, like I say, in Oman, there was Keith Collister in the Jaguar, and there was Kieran and Norm in uh, uh, the January just before the start when on our detachment once we we got out there so it was um, people were pushing hard people were working hard they were working long hours they were doing stuff that they if they if it wasn't brand new they hadn't done it for years you know we, none of the Germany crews were air to air qualified because there was never a requirement to be air to air qualified because there was never going to be a tanker near the, the inner German border um, but suddenly we all had to get air to air qualified not so much of an issue for navigators but certainly for the pilots uh, and certainly on the way trail down in january 
we had a couple of crews who'd never tanked from a, a TriStar, and yet they were going down on the trail on a TriStar to to get to Saudi. And well, you know, do your best, um, crack on, lads. Um, fortunately, there were enough diversions on, on the way that if uh, if they did have a mishap, they could go elsewhere. But it was that so everything all the way through to the end of the war. There were certain elements of learning on the hoof. What did you know about uh, the Iraqis then at, at that point? I mean, there is this sort of, uh, if, if you talk to people about the Falklands, uh, in, in some instances, you know, the, the, the initial reaction was, where's that? Um, mm-hmm. you know, did, did, did you in your intelligence vaults have lots of information about them? Did you know what their armed forces were like? Did you know what their, their culture was? What did you know? Well, no, my, my what's that, where's that um, moment came in 2000 with Sierra Leone. Um, but I knew where Iraq was uh, and I knew that they'd just had the Iran-Iraq war, which finished in 88. Um, so we knew that they were experienced. We knew um, that they yeah, they had a good armed forces. It was also an enormous armed forces. So it was quite daunting. Uh, we had uh, a navigator on the squadron who knew more than us because he'd been there in 61 when we'd um, uh, when, when we'd supported Kuwait in the first instance. So I, I think he'd been on javelins or something at that stage uh, or whatever wow. it was. Um, you know, so, so he uh, he was uh, he, he, he was great to, to talk to. You know, he was clearly one of the senior guys. He didn't go to war because he was that much yeah, longer in the tooth, shall we say. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, we, we did have. Uh, a, a very good respect for them uh, and we knew their well we, we came to know through defend, uh, intelligence briefs which we had you know endless intelligence briefs as you might expect uh, we came to know that their integrated air defense system was pretty formidable uh, and it was you know it was um, uh, which is why on the first night the americans went out to completely uh, um, disable it as much as they can uh, as much as they could, they didn't achieve that. Um, but yeah, they they did good efforts. But it was always a very capable air defence system throughout the war. It was called Carry, wasn't it? Which was sort of French for Iraq, because uh, I think the French had had built it. And but can can you can you describe then, just in general terms, what an, an IADS is, what an integrated air defence system is, and, and why it's important that you dismantle it in the way you describe? Well, you have to look at sort of. 80 years ago yesterday with um, the Battle of Britain, an integrated air defence system is, it's the integrated bit. You know, you you have uh, a man with a missile or, you know, a command post with uh, a battery of missiles uh, and they can fire off, uh, but there's nothing integrated about that. What is integrated is um, early warning as much as as soon as possible uh, to make sure that the systems are warmed up, you know, where... um, ready to fire for the aircraft that are coming in your direction uh, and that you fire that the right system fires uh, according to capabilities whether it's high low um, that you don't fire too many because it's you, you've got to um, continue uh, to counter the enemy throughout the the night the, the week the war uh, so it's it's making sure that the information is the right information is in the right place to the right people, uh, to the commanders, so they can make the right decisions to engage the enemy uh, 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 sufficiently. So it's not just firing a missile, it's making sure that uh, you have the, the means to counter the aircraft, but also to understand what is happening, to build up your recognized air picture. Is there supposed to be a central control element to this? Uh, I remember, again, it is just from memory, there were sort of uh, integrated operations and IOX integration or integrated yeah. operations. And, and uh, so these were sort of central nodes that all the information was fed back to. And then presumably an Iraqi general would orchestrate or, or, or similar. It, it depends. I mean, so in some ways, the Iraqi system was based on the Soviet system, which is very centralized control. Um, but not wholly. Uh, yes, there is one big headquarters where you would expect they've got all the information, but the local commander did have the uh, the authority to fire if he thought the parameters were correct. Uh, and everything I said about uh, using the missiles wisely often didn't happen. 
Uh, and there was, as you've seen on the film, yeah, there's a lot of AAA anti-aircraft fire, uh, and there were a lot of missiles being fired willy-nilly. Uh, but they, by and large, I don't think they were fired ballistically. They, they weren't just shot into the air. They were aimed. Uh, and later, they became quite innovative uh, of um, certainly daylight uh, firing, optically fired, uh, and only illuminating right at the, with the radar right at the last minute so that you didn't get the warning on your radar warning receiver. So if you don't see the, the boost, the, the, the smoke of the missile, it's very difficult to pick up the missile. Uh, and if you've, if you've got uh, very difficult to pick up visually, and if you don't have a radar warning receiver and you don't have a missile warning receiver to actually pick up the, the missile and alert you, you stand little chance and we lost an aircraft later on in the war because of that uh, and the the distinction between a sort of radar warning receiver is that it, it picks up rf energy and a missile missile warning receiver i think uses uv uh, detects the uv radiation from the missile plume yeah U, uv uh, this, this is my previous job sort of last year uh, in trying to sell this stuff um <laughs> so the stuff i probably shouldn't say um yeah, the, the older missile warning systems were UV. We're now going to IR missile warning systems, which uh, give a longer range, but are more sensitive. That's probably the very basic explanation. Sure. But um, certainly Tornado only had a, a, a radar warning receiver because it's primar primary threat with a radar uh, system. Uh, Chinook that I used to fly had missile warning and radar warning. But the radar warning was uh, of a, a lesser importance because your threat on a Chinook was an infrared missile. So a radar warning receiver is not going to pick that up, but a missile warner will pick up anything that's coming towards you. And I think I'm correct in, in saying that, you know, in 1990, RAWs, radar warning receivers, were very common, but, but missile warning receivers maybe were reserved only for the Special Forces aircraft yeah. and that kind of thing. So they yeah, weren't mainstream. Correct. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Tornado didn't have it. How, how did you feel then? I mean, so last question before sort of we, we maybe sort of break for the night. But um, mm -hmm. how, how did you feel deploying then? What were the thoughts and emotions that sort of that were going through you at that time? Uh, again, you have to remember, I was probably 23. So single, um, excited. You know, this is what you train for. I think everybody was excited to a, a lesser or greater degree, but we were also worried because we knew that there was this is no walkover. This is this is no sharp and mango type war. The, this was a proper, properly constituted army air force with a really integrated air defense system, a big armed forces, uh, and a determination to. Uh, to maintain their presence in Kuwait. So it wasn't going to be a walkover. So there was an absolute mix of excitement because we were going to do what we trained for uh, and worry that this was going to be hard. Uh, and probably, you know, that the people wouldn't come back, although I don't, people generally don't say that. But, you know, you, you, you just know that it's going to be hard work. Had the simulations been done at that point? Um, I think the, what I read the, was that they were expecting sort of 30% losses in the first, I don't know, X number of days, very short period of time. Had, had that been done prior to you deploying? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I'm not sure. I don't recall how much we'd been exposed to that. Um, I think on our squadron that they'd sort of, it hadn't really been stated, uh, or it certainly, if it had been stated, people probably offers being uh, far too pessimistic. But I know that there were people taking it seriously. Uh, and I you know, subsequently found out from a friend who was the uh, intelligence officer uh, and the admin officer on the squad at the time who didn't deploy, that uh, you know, she and all her staff did uh, all the um, um, informing, uh, kin forming, um courses and you know how to break the news and you know what to do with the bodies and all that sort of thing which we weren't told about at the time mm -hmm. for obvious reasons i think were you were you hard crude uh, is that an expression yeah 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 um yeah um 
Yeah, you're right. What is the expression? It's, it's escaped me. Uh, but uh, it's 30 years away and it's 9.30 at night. Um, what, what, formed, formed crews, whatever. Uh, yeah, I was with a pilot. So I was one of the most junior navigators, uh, probably one of the most junior navigators in the whole detachment, certainly one of the youngest, if not the youngest. Um, the, so I was with a fairly experienced second tourist pilot uh, and we were, everybody was crewed up together. There were a couple of crews as the war went on that got changed because it, it just turned out to be a clash of personalities. Uh, but that was it. Most of the time you were um, almost wedded to your uh, your crewmate. Uh, and you were so it was also a, a f- properly constituted full ship as well. So it wasn't just you and the pilot. It was you, the pilot and the other three aircraft. Uh, and I happened to be in the full ship of um, OC-31, uh, Jerry Witts. Uh, so, yeah, you knew, uh, you know, with, with him, being in the boss's full ship, you were probably going to take part in the first night. Which is a great point for us to <laughs> to break. <laughs> don't don't bail on me and not come back and tell me about it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I might be busy tomorrow or whenever. <laughs> this, this would be the worst interview ever. <laughs>